And now, live from Level 5 Productions on the island of Milleronia, it's The Larry Miller Show! Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America, and everyone who hates when nice restaurants get torn down. Hi, folks, and welcome back to The Larry Miller Show. I'm Larry Miller, but in a way, aren't we all? And I'm very happy today because I had a very good audition. I had a terrific audition, but I'm going to tell you about that because something happened as a result of it. But boy, it was a good one, and it was, uh, it's great to be here with Colonel Jeff. We are not on Milleronia. It's another day in, ca- in this case, uh, partly because of my audition, but we're back on the mainland and in our studio here. And, but we, we both feel great. Boy, I'll tell you folks, after doing the prep work for a show and feeling good about the things we have, and then that music comes on. Well, it just sets us up. It sets us up just fine. And, of course, that's the Jeb Adamson Orchestra and the Regina Panzo Dancers featuring boy tenor Jim Broderick asking the musical question, Would musical history be different if Tom Mix had a fear of heights? Not on this show, Jim. No, that's a good question. And what Jim means is that every uh, every week on the show, once or twice, Every so often, I guess maybe three times, but once or twice, I always mention the great Tom Mix because there was, I remember as a kid, guys used to sing, other kids, you know, would sing, uh, uh, oh, da, 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 sh- shaving a haircut, two bits, who's on the mountain, Tom Mix. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> In case you'd forgotten the tune. But that's right, shave and a haircut, two bits, who's on the mountain, Tom Mix. And that came, I I don't know exactly, it came from his stardom. He was a big movie star in, uh, well, in the silent era, in the uh, late teens and through all the 20s here in Hollywood. And everyone really liked him, and he uh, he would... uh, would be on a lot of mountains in in his movies he would be on mountains and uh he would be chasing bad guys and he would be on the mountains and he could rear up and well like the lone ranger and that horse would uh would pose like that well he was just great anyway and and uh i have a lot of respect for him and for everything he did and i love bringing his name into the show and so jim was just asking Jim Broderick wondered, would musical history be different if Tom Mix had a fear of heights? So, as the colonel and I thought, he meaning uh, if he never went on the mountain, if he never went on any mountains, would musical history uh, be different? And as I said already, not on this show, baby, because you know what? It would be on this show forever. I would always want to have something about Tom Mix just like that. And I bet you would too. And Jim, I wish I had a a more flippant answer for you, but would uh, musical history be different if Tom Mix had a fear of heights? No. No, Jim, no. It would be on our show forever. And Tom Mix, God bless him, Wherever he is now in heaven, I'll I'll bet you he he feels the same way. And in fact, I'll bet you when I read your question, he actually almost did a spit take on the tuna salad he was eating. And it, what? What? He was a great guy. And in fact, uh, he was at Wyatt Earp's funeral. And they were friends together. And that figures into this show, too. So let's get on with it and see how it all ties together. So, and by Amazon, PayPal, and my book. I love our sponsors very much. Amazon, of course, still does three things no other company in the world 
can do or will do. Number one, order whatever you want from them. Whatever you want, they'll get it for you. Number two, they already have it. They don't even have, they don't have to make it. They don't have to borrow it. They don't have to order it. They have it right there. And number three, the, the best thing about Amazon, they send us a percentage of whatever it is you order. Now that's pretty good. They send us here at the Larry Miller show money from whatever you order from them. Now, uh, wouldn't that be different? If Tom Mix had a fear of heights also? No, no, no. But they do that, and it means a lot. We take that money. Well, we we put it right in that box, our safety box, where we save money for our next big fancy fried chicken dinner with two drinks beforehand in a different place. And that figures into the story I'm going to tell you, too. How about that? Boy, this is a show so good, I want to hear it. But uh, go to Amazon. Don't go yourself. Let us take you there. You don't have to use your iPhone or your laptop or anything else you have. Just just go to our website. That's LarryMillerPodcast.com. Who's on the mountain? Tom Mix. <laughs> that sound always gets me. I always want to look around and say, oh, I should have had the fish. But anyway, uh, you know what? Uh, <laughs> go to our website. We have a banner that says Amazon on it. Click our banner and then go to sleep. Take a nap. Lay back in your easy boy chair and put a put a big magazine over your face and and, and take a nice nap in the middle of the day. And we'll get you there. Colonel Jeff and I have a signal, a red light on our phones, and it has two purposes. One, if the president is calling us and needs us to rescue some people, that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Not in eight years. Perhaps next time. <laughs> but you know what? We'll get you to Amazon. And there's another banner there that says PayPal on our website. That's right, and PayPal, oh, they're terrific. You know what? They really are. They make you feel like you're saving the world. So do the same thing, by the way. Go go to our website, LarryMillerPodcast.com. Who's on the mountain? Tom Mix. <laughs> Boy, they, they're, they're not generous drivers up in these areas, are they? they? They honk that horn. They want you out of the way. But you know what? PayPal is great. And I mean, instead of saying, you know, donate or pay what you like, I like to say buy us some drinks. Because if you enjoy my show here and you want to send us a few bucks to help out, and why wouldn't you do it through PayPal? But there are different uh, there are different levels of drinking. That's why I love using it. There's level one through five all the way up to... We're driving to Florida! <laughs> You know what? That's a good bit. <laughs> I wrote it and I perform it, and I think that's a pretty good bit. So look for the PayPal banner on our website. Every little bit helps, folks, and helps us keep the old leg lamp lit. And thanks to everyone who has contributed already. It means a lot to us. And thank you for those who are going to contribute right now. And by me. That's right. Signed hardcover copies of my book, Spoiled Rotten America are now for sale at store.comedyfilmnerds.com. It did really well when it was released, and I'm very proud of it, and it's funny, and I think you'll like it too. So go there and buy it, or buy more than one. Buy ten. <laughs> that would make this the favorite segment of the show for me. Anyway, that brings us actually to my real favorite segment of the show, the joke of the week. Boy, I love this. I love telling a joke every week, and uh, it's a great way to pass along something like that to you, and you can pass it along to someone else. And this is a good one. The Colonel and I both, both like this one. A very lovely blonde 
walks into a hardware store and the owner comes up, says, may I help you? And she says, yes, uh, I, I have five big trees on my lawn and I want to get rid of them. I hate them and I, and I have to get rid of them. And I want to, I want to just, you know, chop them all down and chop them all up or something. What can you do to help me? And he says, you know what? I think I've got just the thing for you. He goes in the back and comes out with a chainsaw. And he says, this is the perfect thing for those trees. You'll cut those five trees down in less than five minutes. And she's impressed and she's sold. And she says, I'll take it. And she pays for it and heads back out to the car with it. And you know, folks, just a few days later, she comes right back in with the chainsaw, the same saw. And the owner says to her, what's, what, what's wrong? What happened? And she said, this is the worst piece of junk I've ever had in my life. And I'm sorry I bought it from you here. You know what? It, five trees in five minutes, really? You know what? It took me an hour just to cut down one tree. And I, want, I, I, I don't want this. I want to give it back and I want my money back. And uh, he says, wow, to be honest, I'm a little surprised. But And he takes it from her and he... And he gets the, the cord on it, and he pulls the cord, and it goes, Rrrr! and she gets scared and says, what's that noise? <laughs> and that made us laugh. Wow, holy mackerel, you mean she cut down one tree without turning it on? Well, first of all, God bless her, that's a strong kid. But that's why, no. She should have read the manual or just listened to the guy. He should have been clearer. In any case, we like that joke here. We hope you like it too. Pass it along to a loved one or a family member or one of your old college pals. And that brings us to my second favorite part of the show, The Poetry Corner. This is such a good poem, I'm not even annoyed that guy coughs again in the audience. But <laughs> it's written by Letitia Elizabeth Landon. And she was British, born in 1802, died in 1838. She was only 36, but uh, she was very well known and beloved there. As a poet, she contributed to a weekly literary magazine and became one of its editors. She was known as L.E.L. to her readers and fans. Her poems were very popular at the time, and she died, sadly, from an overdose of hydrocyanic acid, otherwise known to us as cyanide, which was uh, apparently an accident on her part. She wasn't trying to do anything to herself. But there you are, a great poet, and this one is called... Revenge. I gaze upon her rose-wreathed hair, and gaze upon her smile. Seems as you drank the very air, her breath perfumed the while, and wake for her the gifted line that wild and witching lay, and swear your heart is as a shrine that only owns her sway. "'Tis well I am revenged at last, mark you that scornful cheek. The eye averted as you passed, spoke more than words could speak. I now, by all the bitter tears that I have shed for thee, the racking doubts, the burning fears, avenged they well may be, by the nights passed in sleepless care, the days of endless woe, all that you taught my heart to bear, all that yourself will know. I would not wish to see you laid within an early tomb. I should forget how you betrayed and only weep your doom. But this is fitting punishment, to live and love in vain. O oh, my wrung heart, be thou content and feed upon his pain. Go thou and watch her lightest sigh. Thine own it will not be, 
and bask beneath her sunny eye, it will not turn on thee. Tis well, the rack, the chain, the wheel, far better hadst thou proved, even I could almost pity feel, for thou art nor beloved. Well, that's awfully nice, isn't it? Thank you, Letitia. As ever, I've mentioned this before, but when a good or a great poet decides to look at love and how it's handled and how it comes to good or how it comes to naught, it's worth remembering, and I hope you folks like that one. Revenge by Letitia Elizabeth Landon. And that brings to my third favorite part of the show. M M M Triple M The Magic Movie Moment Oh, this is a good one. I've seen this movie and loved it every time. I've seen it, oh, 30 times. And you'll love it too if you haven't seen it. It's called The Bishop's Wife from 1947. It was remade, by the way, recently, I think just uh, five years or so ago, uh, and as The Bishop's Wife, and I think Denzel Washington was in it, was starring in it, and a bunch of other folks. But this is, well, the first and the real Bishop's Wife. I love this movie, directed by Henry Coster, starring Cary Grant, David Niven, Loretta Young, Monty Woolley, Elsa Lanchester who, by the way, was married to Charles Lawton. And it's a wonderful movie, folks. And it's about, well, the bishop's wife, the bishop, David Niven, and his wife, Loretta Young, and an angel who comes down to help them, who is played by Cary Grant, and his character's name is Dudley. And the magic movie moment in this movie for me is that everyone falls for Dudley, but he falls for them even more. That when Cary Grant, this angel, comes down, and that's his job. He's sent by God, and every time someone asks for help, he comes down. And he's always done a great job. And he's kind of their number one guy. But this time, as he comes into this town just before Christmas in 1947, well... He falls for the town, and he falls for the people in it, and he wishes he could be a bishop here, and he wishes he could be in that church, and he wishes he could have that house, and he wishes that he could help them. And he does all of these things. He helps everyone all the way, but we see his desire. We see that he's falling in love with Loretta Young, the bishop's wife. And we see that all the women in the movie are falling for him and that all the men want to be his friend. It's really wonderful. Cary Grant is one of the greatest actors we've ever had, and he could do everything. He could do comedy and drama. He he had ways of speaking that were just wonderful. So many of his movies, like Mr. Lucky, that I've talked about here before is just a great movie because of Cary Grant. And you know what, folks? In this movie, I think you're going to love him too because, well, as I already said, everyone falls for Dudley, but he falls for them even more. Give it a try. If you haven't seen The Bishop's Wife before, give it a try. You'll be glad you did. And if you've seen it before but it's been a long time, try it again. You won't be sorry you did. And you know what? It reminded me. That's why, frankly, I mentioned I was in town for an audition here today. And I'll tell you the truth. It got me thinking about wanting something that you're not supposed to get. I don't mean me as an actor, but I remember all the things about Hollywood that used to be around and uh, just aren't around anymore. My audition was at uh, Studio Raleigh Studios, which uh, is right across the street from Paramount. And I was a little late, and the guard at the gate, I mean, just a minute or two late, I had a, a noon audition. 
And so I walked in the gate because I was supposed to park on the street there, which is a sign of their great respect for me to write down on that. By the way, there's plenty of parking on the street. But I walked, so I did, and I walked in there a couple of blocks. And uh, the guard at the gate, a nice lady, was uh, there, and uh, she heard. I said, uh, do you know when I named the movie? And, uh, and she said, yes, it's uh, right there. And then she saw, about 50 feet away, she saw a guy who waved at her. He's wearing jeans and a T-shirt, and he's obviously, to me anyway, to my eye, as a compliment, he looked like he was someone working on one of the TV shows or one of the movies being shot at this studio. And uh, she calls out, and uh, he says, oh, hi, and they're, as I said, about 50 feet away, and she calls back to him, I was wondering where you were. Someone uh, took your parking spot today, and I uh, got them out of it. You know, I said, well, you know, you're not here yet, but you're coming. Now, I'm standing there, and I'm a little late for this audition. Uh, that's not the end of the world. The sun's not going to stop spinning. But still, she and I had already started speaking. And to be honest, I needed to go to the bathroom. But in a way that it's sort of like if you have a condition and you need to go, whether it's part-time diabetes like me or something, but... If I have to go to the bathroom, anyone who has to go to the bathroom the way I did has to go to the bathroom. That's that, that's a no kidding around thing. So I'm standing there on the open lot at the gate to the studio with a guard who's talking to her from 50 feet away and keep, walks up closer. They're having a chat about parking there while I'm, folks, I'm 48 seconds away from emptying everything in my body. I mean, that's just the way it is. That's not a, this, it's not a happy story. And I said, th now this is something that has to get done. I'm never rude to people. You're never rude to people. But every so often you have to. So she's talking with her back to me now. And she, we started the conversation, but she hasn't told me where the audition is. And she hasn't told me where, where the bathroom is. And I need both fast. But I mean fast. And I so I just did something I've never done before. I interrupted them in a loud voice. I just, with her back to me, I just said, Excuse me, is it all right if I empty my bowels right here on the sidewalk in front of you? Or, you know what, maybe I should go to the bathroom. Would that be, yeah, you know, and she looked at me. She blinked a couple of times. She's never heard anyone say this. Who has? But, I mean, I I needed to get her attention that second. And I just said, uh, and she started to speak. I said, do me a favor, just point to where the studio is and where the nearest bathroom is. Let's get that done, okay? And it was in a louder voice than normal. And she said, well, that's that's the, uh, right there, this, behind the white columns is the studio door you, you want to go in. And, uh, and I said, and the bathroom still loud and she said it's right before it and, you know and uh and i didn't say thank you i didn't say good day i didn't i didn't you know tip my hat so to speak i didn't do anything i left i had the information i needed and i quick walked a uh, boy oh, was about a hundred feet down there and uh i got to the bathroom and i think the phrase just in time applies here. I mean, folks, I got in and it was quite a bit happened, but it I, it had to happen. It was going to happen at that second. It's just nice. It's a nice blessing that it happened in a bathroom at that second. And so I did and I, whew, boy, oh boy, holy mackerel. And I, well, I, you know, cleaned up the way uh, any, any human should. And I, and I uh, tucked everything in and walked over and washed up the way everyone should. And then, whew, folks, I was, I was almost buzzing head to toe. I mean, I was almost vibrating with some kind of sense that, 
well, that had to happen. And then I went up to the audition, and I uh, said I had a terrific audition. I was very happy. And the uh, lady, the, the casting director there, was very nice. And, in fact, she gave me a good note or two. It, uh, when, it's a, when it's a good audition, you can get... It's like working with a good director when you work with a good casting director. And you can get a good note. You know what? Think about this. And then the, he said, because the way I originally thought of this guy, and uh, I had a terrific audition. And uh, then I, I went to downstairs, and I felt so good. You know what? Maybe it's like this in every line of work, but to me... When I've I've had a good audition, and by the way, as I was walking out back to the gate there, down the little studio street, I was wondering, am I going to see the guard again? I don't need to. I didn't need to say anything to her. And you know, you know what? Maybe she thought it was okay to have a chat with someone there, but I already told you I needed what I needed, and I needed it then. And uh, sure enough, she was walking down the street the other way. We passed each other. But it was kind of perfect in a way. She didn't look at me. I didn't look at her. Neither one of us felt the need to say, well, goodbye. And I think that's just about right. I turned out of the gate walking and hit the sidewalk and started walking. You know, not fast, just happy about a great audition. And I got uh, walked a couple of blocks back to my car and I... Turned down, I went up to Hollywood Boulevard, turned down Hollywood Boulevard, and I was going to go back across into the valley where I, well, where I live. And that's where I was going to meet Colonel Jeff here for recording this episode. And I passed, I was in the car, and on Hollywood Boulevard, I saw up ahead Musso and Frank. I've told you about them before. Musso and Frank, and it says right on the sign, since 1919. And by the way, that makes them officially the oldest restaurant in Hollywood in Los Angeles. And they have been there since, well, 1919. And they have been exactly what they are since 1919. And that's the place that Colonel Jeff and Dr. Chris and I went for the first part of our first big fancy fried chicken dinner with two drinks beforehand in a different place. And we decided that day, I've told you this story before, I'm not going to go through it in detail, but that day, part of our first big fancy fried chicken dinner was going to be that we would bring suits to a barber shop that I knew of near my chiropractor. And uh, so this was going to be about four o'clock or so when we made, I made an appointment for us, for the three of us, we didn't shave for a couple of days beforehand because these folks give you a real shave, a real barber's shave. And wow, that's, you know, with a, with a, well, with a real razor and, uh, oh, with the towels that have creams on them. And I mean, it's not in a fancy part of town, but barbershops don't do that anymore. Oh, maybe one or so here and there. But these folks do a good job, and we took our suits in there and hung them up and our dress shoes, and we sat there, and we were happy. We sat there. It was like being in Mayberry, waiting for a haircut with Floyd, and uh, except, well, maybe it was better than that. But we had our three shaves in a row, one, two, three, and those towels and that heat and that cream and that razor made us feel pretty darn good. We really did. And then the three of us just walked in their back room there and changed and put our suits on. Suits and shirts and ties and our fancy shoes. And then we decided, we had already planned this, that, well, for our dinner, what we were going to do was go to Roscoe's House of Chicken and Waffles, which I've talked about before, but before that, for our two drinks in a different place, we decided to go to Musso and Frank and sit right where Wyatt Earp sat. And that is no kidding. That's right, I said Wyatt Earp. I've mentioned that before here, but I think that's terrific. 
that when Musso and Frank opened in 1919, Wyatt Earp loved it, and that's where he drank. And that's where, until he passed on in 1927 or 28, and at his funeral, Tom Mix wept. And uh, we decided to go to Musso and Frank, and we did. And folks, you sit at their stools at that bar, and that place feels just the way it does in the photos they have in the hallway. You know how older places do that? I love when they do it in Hollywood. They have a you know the shot of the first Musso and Frank in 1919. And not only what that, but what Hollywood Boulevard looked like, well, in 1919. And uh, a couple of stores down in the picture, I noticed there was, uh, there was a sign that said, uh, Mutual pays 6%. And that just puzzled me. I t- said that to Colonel Jeff, and he, he said, what does that mean? And I said, I don't know. I, I, I think maybe it means, does that sound like a betting parlor or something from 1919? But they didn't just have those things, did they? In any case, I walked in there, and I had just had this good audition, and the place was, it was about one fifteen now. And the place was not empty, but uh, in the nice part of it, it was uh, just a couple of folks here and a couple of folks there, and the rest was empty. And that's fine with me. And uh, the lady, uh, the Mater D, just walked me to a, a two-top a, a table for two, and uh, against the wooden wall that separates you from the bar where Wyatt Earp liked to drink. But she said, is this all right? And I said, with a smile, I said, would you mind if I take one of those bigger tables in the back there? And she said, well, not at all. And she walked me over and she said, I know what you mean. Sometimes you just need a little more room. And I said, that's right. And I said, it's kind of a celebration. I just had a terrific audition. And she smiled, and these were real smiles, too. She said, good for you. That's awfully nice to hear. And uh, she, she sat me down there and gave me a menu. And, folks, it was it was a heck of a meal. Every so often, I think I like to go crazy. Not mad crazy, but, and I'm sure you like to do this, too. And I ordered, they have a, a liver steak, calves liver steak. And it was just the size my mom used to make, God bless her, thicker than just the, the little cutlets there. And I got that, and they put onions on it that they've sautéed. And as an appetizer, by the way, I got stuffed celery. And, oh, you know what the thing is about stuffed celery? I had no idea what it was. I've never heard of it. It was, you know, you look at everything. I said, It was eight bucks on the menu, and I thought, I said, let me start with the stuffed celery, please. And uh, the waiter smiled and said, that's a good choice. I like the stuffed celery here. I said, good, I'm glad to hear that. And I also ordered, by the way, it was. he asked me how I wanted the, the liver done. He said he gets it medium rare, but it's a little pink in there when he does. And uh, he said, if you want, I'll order it medium well for you. And that uh, that's a little more done done. And I said, that sounds good. And I said, also a, also, a pan of sautéed mushrooms, please, that I saw on the, on, the, on the bill of fare. And he, it was a great moment. He gave me a nod and a smile. He was a young guy. And he gave him that look in the eye of uh, good order. And I didn't have anything to drink. It was sometimes with a meal like that, you think, well, maybe I should have a cocktail beforehand, you know from the bar Wyatt Earp used to love. But I didn't, and I was coming here to work and do a show, and uh, so I just had cold water. And folks, I'm telling you, that was a terrific meal. It was so good, and they brought a plate with four slices of bread and butter, and the butter was soft. And I had it. I was like, well, I've got to have a slice of that. And I did, and folks, then I had four slices of it and i ate the stuffed mushrooms and i ate the liver and i'm telling you well 
I was walking in tall cotton. I felt terrific. It's there. Yeah, well, they're not. It's not a cheap place. Uh, the uh, the meal was uh, forty four dollars and change, plus tip. And who wouldn't want to tip generously in a nice place like that? And it reminds you, well, Wyatt Earp loved it. And uh, sometimes people say over history, hey, who were the good guys and who were the bad guys at the OK Corral? I'll tell you who. None of the Clanton gang ever showed up at Musso and Frank. That was for Wyatt Earp. And if you need to hear more than that, I can't help you. But the thing is that I had the best time there, and Hollywood throws a lot of things out, especially in restaurants. Well, there's Chasen's, the Brown Derby, the Macambo, the Coconut Grove, Trader Vic's. They're all gone or repurposed into studios or discos. The first and only time I was at Chasen's, it was already a studio. I was working there in, uh, what was it, the computer wore tennis shoes. And I was thrilled. I thought, hey, I'm at Chasen's and I'm doing a couple of good scenes here in this part. That was, it was a big part, but the, that, that time of it then was, that's right, with Dean Jones, the great Dean Jones. And he was terrific in this. So we were at Chasen's acting. But what, what's better than that? And you know what? In Hollywood history, they're very well known because these places, folks, well, these places were popular the second they opened, and I mean the second. Well, Musso and Frank was the first, but, you know, six months and a year and two years after that, as all the really famous Hollywood restaurants opened up, they became really well attended by the biggest stars in Hollywood, but they had nothing on the menu at that point. They had, well, a cheese sandwich on white bread. And a couple of things like that, and coffee, and the, those so that first couple of weeks, couple of months, and they were people flocked in there to get that all the biggest stars, and the reason was it turns out they knew they could trust it. Everything in those days, well, if you can imagine, in nineteen, 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 twenty, nineteen, and in the early twenties, what did they serve in these places? How long did they keep it? Where did they keep it? My mom, I remember, used to tell us when we were on a trip. You know what? Uh, no tuna salad uh, today when we stop at a, oh, you know, a, a diner somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Because then she was saying, she wasn't being paranoid, but it was a good point. Who knows how long that mayonnaise has been in that tuna? It's sort of like watching a, one of a, a great old Robin Hood movie and they, they come into the, to the pub, you know, have you got any food? Absolutely. And they open a cabinet and there's a hunk of thing in there. What is it? Who knows? But it's a hunk, and it's a thing, and it's a big hunk. And it's just sitting in a cabinet. For what? A year? Four years? And that's why spices were used, by the way. that A lot of folks don't know that. That's why, well, meats that sat around for a while were heavily spiced before they recooked them so that it, well, it didn't kill you. But you know something? The owners of these places, of the restaurants in Hollywood, were always well known, too, in World War II. When they spotted new privates in uniform about to ship out because, well, Los Angeles and Southern California were a big area for that. Not only training, but, well, for that's where they shipped. And uh, when one of the owners saw a couple of 17-year-old faces in army uniforms, he always walked over and made a point, shook hands, wished them luck, say a prayer, and buy their meal. They always bought their meal. And at that point, the fellas had just ordered a salad or something because so, uh, they just had a couple of bucks on them, but he'd always give them a nicer meal and just give it to them on the house. And you know what? And he'd say to them, when we win this war and you come back and God bless you, you'll be fine. You make sure you come back here and we'll have another meal together, okay? Well, these these soldiers just hit the ceiling. They, they'd they never been treated that well. And they knew, the, the owners of the these restaurants knew 
These guys were going to have army food for the next four years, which is fine. But you know what? Uh, these young fellows knew that they could go back to Musso and Frank and to all the other good restaurants and get a nice meal. And that owner would always point and say, now you see that stool? That's where Wyatt Earp stood. And when, uh, yeah, because in those days, Wyatt Earp had already, already passed away. Musso and Frank is just the way it was, folks. And uh, a lot of the other restaurants are gone. And there's, well, there's studios, or as I've worked in a couple of them, but no, they're gone. Casa Vega is still going, celebrating its 60th anniversary right now. That goes back to the, to the 50s. And uh, I thought I might be there later because one of my kids came home from school and, and I said to him, why don't we go out to, uh, you know, get a bite later, you and I, after we record We'll, uh, you know, we'll maybe we'll go to the darkest restaurant in America. That's what we call that one, Casa Vega, because you walk in there. I've never ordered off the menu there because you need 14 or 15 minutes to have your eyes adjust. It's like a cave. That's wonderful. It's a great place with great food, but you need, you, you can't read a thing. So I've always said to the waiter, I can't be the only one, by the way, who's done this there. No one can read a thing, but I've always said to the waiter, uh, yeah, I'd like to order now, but help me out. Uh, do me a favor. Just, uh, yeah, some kind of bean, some kind of rice, and, uh, some kind of thing in it, you know, with a, with a little, you know, Mexican salad on the side or something. And, um, but he knows he doesn't even have to ask. Why don't you read it off the menu? He knows. No one can read in there. Now, by the end of the meal, your eyes have adjusted, you know, and, uh, you're like, uh, <laughs> you're like, you like from a Harry Potter movie. But you know what? I won't be there later, but I'm glad I am I could be there. I'm glad those favorite places are around, Musso and Frank and Casa Vega. And I'm glad I was at Musso and Frank today. And, I'm well, I'm glad I had a great audition today. And I was celebrating that at Musso and Frank and also celebrating that I found a bathroom just in time. And, uh, but you and I know the same things. Homer is Homer. Pluto is a planet. And so remember, as always, if you walked out of bed today and had a job to go to and a home to come back to and someone there who cares about you, folks, the game's over and you've won. And that's still the truest thing I know. Good luck to you all. And we'll see you next time.